Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Freilich, consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome to my YouTube channel and to this explanatory video regarding Morton's neuroma. In this video, I will explain to you what this disease is all about, what it's caused by, its symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's managed. First thing to say about this condition is that its name is a little bit misleading. It kind of sounds like a, something really nasty, perhaps a tumour of some kind, and in fact it is absolutely not a nerve tumour. In fact what it is is some fibrosis of the perineural tissues between the metatarsal heads and the transverse intermetatarsal ligaments. So in effect it's an inflammatory condition of the tissues surrounding the nerves that go to the digits of the toes. In fact a better name which this condition should really go by is Morton's metatarsalgia, which is far more apt for this condition. In terms of its prevalence, this is really unknown, but it's fairly common, and there is a female to male ratio of 10 to 1. Onset is between the ages of 45 and 50, and both feet are equally affected. However, usually when it presents over 90%, it occurs unilaterally. In terms of the digital nerves which are affected. 70% affects the third interdigital nerve and 30% affects the fourth interdigital nerve. There are a number of well-established risk factors for developing this condition. These can include anatomical considerations such as having flat feet or high arches etc, footwear for example high heel shoes and high impact repetitive strain on the feet for example runners joggers and rock climbers to name but a few. There are a number of theories as to how this condition develops. The most important theory is that of chronic repetitive trauma. Then there is the ischemic theory whereby the arteries to the small nerves in the feet become damaged. There's a third theory which is an inflammatory bursitis theory between the metatarsal heads which can cause some fibrosis of the adjacent nerve tissues and entrapment of the digital nerves um, whether due to um, their passing over the edge of the deep transverse metatarsal ligament and rubbing it across them or from overpronation. It's also important to say that a number of these potential etiologies and theories can be present in the same patient at the same time. In terms of clinical symptoms the most important ones are burning pains and aches over the forefoot and this can also then lead on to tingling and numbness as it radiates down from the metatarsal spaces to the toes. It can be exacerbated from walking and standing and is relieved by resting, removing the shoes and massages. Over time and as the condition progresses the pain can move from being a burning aching type of sensation to being very severe and very sharp. In terms of the diagnosis, this is mainly and predominantly a clinical diagnosis as determined by the clinical symptoms as described above and in conjunction with a number of clinical signs. For example, there is web space tenderness. If there's a foot squeeze test, which can lead to something known as Mulder's sign, where there's a clicking sound or, or sensation when side compression is applied to the metatarsal heads. There's a Tinell's test as well, when one does plant a percussion over that web space and there's also a digital nerve stretch test as well. In addition to the clinical symptoms and signs one can also use other investigations to actually visualize the nerves themselves for example with ultrasound scanning or with MRI scanning which are just as efficacious as each other. In terms of who actually needs to go on to have imaging this is a subject of debate in the medical literature and is usually reserved for patients who are either undergoing surgery or for whom there is some uncertainty as to the exact diagnosis. There is also nerve conduction tests and some neurophysiology which can be done as well and I'll talk about this shortly and of course the gold standard for diagnosis is of course histology. In terms of the differential diagnosis there can be degeneration of the metatarsophalangeal joints. There's also Freiberg's disease which is osteonecrosis of the second metatarsal head. This is an extremely rare condition. Synovitis where there is inflammation of the fluids that lubricate across the tendon sheaths and bursitis where there is inflammation of the cushions between the bones and the tendons. Let's work through some neurophysiology here and see what we can show using our tests. The first thing that we need to do is to make sure that there isn't a background peripheral neuropathy and what you can see here on this slide is an example 
taken from a patient who has got an excellent sural nerve sensory response and here you can see that's 37 microvolts in amplitude and that's 37 millionths of a volt and that's a very good size response for this particular nerve and so there's no evidence of a background peripheral neuropathy. If we have a look at the unaffected side as a baseline measure, we can see if we measure the sensory response from the great toe that its amplitude is 5 millionths of a volt, that's 5 microvolts. And we can also see if we look at the interdigit 2 to 3 web space and we stimulate there, that we have also been able to pick up another sensory response of 2.1 microvolts, that's just over 2 millionths of a volt. Let's have a look now at the affected side and here the responses are in green. We can see here, first of all, on the top tracing, the medial plantar sensory response to prove that we haven't got a tarsal tunnel lesion and that's of a normal amplitude and a normal conduction velocity. You can see more information about tarsal tunnel if you look on my separate video explaining this by clicking on the icon above. The next sensory response we have, which is symmetrical to the other side, which is from the great toe sensory response via the medial plantar nerves. And we can see there that its amplitude is 3.3 millionths of a volt. The next one down is taken from the little toe, which makes its way up through the lateral plantar branches. And that's 1.06 microvolts, or just over one millionth of a volt over there. However, we do not have a sensory response from the interdigit 2-3. And so what we have been able to demonstrate very nicely here is that there is an isolated lesion of that interdigital nerve branch from 2-3. Now, nerve conduction studies, neurophysiology is actually quite limited and challenging in the feet. First of all, it's very technically challenging. It's even harder in those patients who are over the age of 50 because um, the nerves do degenerate a little bit and they become harder to record um, just through the natural process of aging. The responses are absolutely tiny and also they can be difficult particularly as we get older, and these can relate to things such as the skin thickness. The skin can become quite hard and thick, and it's very difficult to pass the currents through it, and also to record currents through it. Ankle edema is also quite a challenge, adiposity around the ankle, and of course issues with distal cooling. Normative data is pretty lacking, um, particularly in the digital plantar sensory nerves, and so we're often having to rely on contralateral data, and so this becomes very challenging in patients who've got bilateral symptoms. And also if a patient has a coexisting neuropathy, then it also becomes very difficult to diagnose. In terms of treatment, it's very important to firstly state that there is a general lack of high quality evidence-based medicine in terms of treatment plans. There tends to be a divide in how treatment is provided between conservative measures, which tend to be the initial ways of treating this condition, and the operative measures as well. In terms of conservative measures, there are physical things that can be done, for example, uh, using wide toe box shoes, insoles, although a Cochrane review showed no evidence for the use of pronator insoles, and gastrocnemius stretching exercises. Medications can also be very useful, for example, anti-inflammatory drugs, if appropriate for a particular patient, and local injections, usually comprising of a local anesthetic plus or minus steroids. It's important to note with this type of treatment that 50% of patients will fail this type of treatment and progress onwards to having surgery. And in fact, that in terms of the efficacy of steroids, there's only a very limited literature as to how valuable they truly are. And of course, they have their own complications such as allergic reactions and various skin pigmentation issues too. There are other types of injections too, for example, alcohol to in effect poison the aberrant nerves which is generating the pains. A relatively more recent innovation is ultrasonography guided alcohol injection, which is a very useful technique to make sure that where one is injecting the alcohol is in the precisely the correct place, and this can help reduce any potential uh, complications. Um, usually in the literature, it's reported as having 60 to 85% satisfaction. 
However, it's important to state that multiple attempts are still often necessary, three or four injections may be required, and it is actually painful. And so one has to bear this in mind when making this decision, although one also has to bear in mind what the alternative is, uh, which is of course surgery. With all of this, it's important to take into account symptomatic relief, uh, and these will include analgesics, massages, etc. In terms of operative treatment, there's quite a mixed literature. More recent papers report 80 to 90% success rates, and there are two main options, either removing the effective nerve, which is called excision, or moving it, which is called translocation. There are other options as well, such as radiofrequency ablation, percutaneous electrocoagulation, cryotherapy, and endoscopic decompression. However, the main literature is revolving around excision or translocation. In terms of potential complications, it's always important to consider this when thinking about surgery, and these will include, of course, infection and bruising, persistent numbness, painful nerve stumps, neuromas, incisional region tenderness, scarring, and of course, recurrence. I hope that this has been a useful video. Please do support this channel by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Many thanks.